which had belonged to William the Conqueror, who conquered England. Ha! And then had travelled and through his bloodline the lands of Anjou, Bordeaux, and Brittany were left to the English crown. These were all disputed realms. Later, a second factor came into the Hundred Years' War, which was that of war. England was known to have the best wool, or the best sheep, <laughs> or whales actually, <laughs> the best sheep in the kingdom. The wool from which provided the best wool to go to the highest courts. An interesting point is during the Hundred Years' War, all people who were involved in the trade of sheep, wool, and the manufacture thereof had their passports removed and were banned from leaving the Fair Isle of England so that their skill could not be used upon the continent. The fact that we then went on to ban Holland and France and other European nations from importing our wool is the mainstay and the heart of the Hundred Years' War. All this for a few sheep, eh? We have a poem tonight that is written by an unknown author of the 16th century, which I feel sums up what we're about to talk to, talk to you about tonight. And that is about a mere peasant with a stick facing the most extreme, the most barbaric, so-called most chivalric and certainly the most well-equipped army the world had ever seen. No roaring guns were then in use, they dreamt of no such things. Our English men in fight did use the gallant grey goose wing, and with the gallant grey goose wing against the French did win the day, for we made their riders kick in the plain, and down on the soil they lay. The grey goose wing is an hour, with the Let us then talk about what actually projected this weapon. This <laughs> the longbow. Stands approximately six feet tall. Traditionally, so we are told it stands six feet tall plus a fist mel or the height of an archer plus a fist mel. A fist mel being that, which is a cleansed fist with the thumb extended. So, obviously this is too big for me. You've shrunk in the right. But that traditionalism came in at a later period. This bow is an exact replica of one that was found on the Mary Rose. It's been tidied up a little bit. It doesn't look so rough hewn. But it is an exact replica. This is on the lower warbow class. This bow draws approximately 85 inches when drawn 85 pounds and drawn 28 inches back. That is the face here. The string that you see hanging limply, because I'm just putting off string in the damn thing, is made from linen, hemp, or in its crude form, flax. It was waxed to preserve its longevity and to maintain a moisture content within. This is very important. If a string breaks while the archer is at full draw, the bow should be cast away because it will break up. Spare strings were usually kept shut up under the hat by the archers, hence the old saying, to keep it under your hat. It was said that archers tended to develop a ball patch in this place to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're going to say. <laughs> At the end of the bow, you'll notice there are two large points. These are made from horn. They have a reason. They are fixed to the bow with a glue made from boiled down bluebell bulbs. If anyone doesn't know what a bluebell is, don't ask me because I can't describe it. <laughs> These were mashed down and boiled into a paste. It took approximately three days for this glue to set. The span, the circumference of the bow, is approximately two inches, all the way around. Obviously it would be enlarged or shrunk to match the individual archer. 
The bow itself is what we call a D shape, flat on the front, rounded across the belly. Now, shall we? Ah, there we go. The bow is cut from a tree in this fashion, this being towards the centre of the tree and this being towards the outside of the tree. You can see that in the centre we have the denser wood and for the outside we have the more sap wood where the light of the tree rises to its branches. The bow is cut in this fashion with the belly being this part where the hand grips and the back being this part which faces the enemy. This part here has excellent stretch and this part resists compression and together they combine to make a spring, a very, very good natural spring. In a moment I'll show you an excellent new longbow view which just describe that very cool. When we string this bow, there is a technique to be used. Because if you don't do it right, it can cause you severe groin injury. The secret is to put the handle of the bow just below the buttock. The bottom knock across the right foot. Bracing the bow with the left elbow. Bring the right foot around, press the buttock backwards Strain in grunt, and if anybody hears some weird wonderful noises, snap, crack, groan, see me fall to the floor in agony, don't put my leg back together. <laughs> <laughs> Call for a paramedic for it. <coughs> Lots of ice, please. <laughs> no, I can never get used to that. <laughs> the long bow. When the bow is drawn, it is drawn in a fashion not so much to draw the string back to the face, but as to push the bow away from you as well as draw back to the face, like so. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> the bow, during peacetime, we think from Experimental archaeology, which is basically having a go and doing it, will probably just be drawn back to the fence. But during wartime, when you require extra cast, that is the length of the arrow flies, the bow would be drawn back as far as the ear. And when this bow is drawn back to that fashion, it's probably drawing somewhere in the region of about 95 pounds. That is the weight upon these fingers, between these shoulders and these elbows. At this point, <laughs> it's 95 pounds. <laughs> it can project an arrow in excess of 200 yards. It can project a war arrow in excess of 200 yards. This is an excellent bow. This is a new bow. Now you can see here, the whiter wood here is from the edge of the tree, and the darker wood is from the belly. These combine to make such an excellent spring. This is a very great and rare bow because to get a piece of you in such good condition now is incredibly rare because so many of you trees went down during the 14th century and later to provide bows. Other woods that were used to make bows were generally shaded Drona L, which was favoured by the archers of Glamorganshire, which was on the borders of South Wales. Ash, beech, and in one case in Denmark, they have found a replica, sorry, not a replica, they have found an oak bow, which they believe to be drawn somewhere in the region of 80 pounds. Now, we know of people that have actually replicated this bow in oak, but it's to shoot it. Once the string had returned, to cast the arrow, the shockwave in the hand was extreme. Whereas with the U-bow, you hardly feel it at all. The yew trees during the 14th century and the 15th century were cut down and decimated throughout the Isles of Britain. So much so 
that we thought, hey, hang on, we need you to make bows because the mainstay of the English army at this time, because of Edward III, is the bow. Spain wants to import wines and ports to Britain. So instead of charging them money, we'll charge them you. So for every single bottle of port or wine that was imported into Britain, they had to provide us with Spanish bow wood from a huge tree. Fair deal. We'll have it. From this was made bows for the nation. When we draw back the longbow to its full extent, just to show you how fragile it is, it is 90% of the weight of breaking. Right there. Or nine tenths of the way. That last 10% doesn't take a great deal. Unless, of course, you happen to fly over the Atlantic and use American Airlines, who um, <laughs> put them in the wrong hold and happen to break them, and then you need only to go back three inches and they break and smash your face up. The greatest danger for these bows is that you need to warm them before you shoot them. If you don't warm them and you just get out shooting the cold, they have a habit of breaking. Wake up, you. When the bow is drawn back, if it should break, generally in the centre, then the top lid flies and strikes in. The bottom lid flies probably faster, it feels faster. <laughs> flies and strikes here, <laughs> causing a very large intake of breath, extreme groaning agony, and the quantum has to which end to hold. It's not a pleasant thing, believe you me. <coughs> Such is the danger to draw these bows. However, we do know that they were a very expendable item by the sheer amount of bows that were taken to war. Approximately for every archer was taken three bows in any campaign. Arrows were very expendable as well. An interesting point on bows is that not long before the Battle of Cressay, the Marshal of Chester did order that every single Bowyer and Fletcher be held under arrest because no arrows or bows could be found within the realms of England and Wales. So he said, alright, go and arrest the lot, get some Spanish imported you, and force them to make bows for nothing. This is how valuable they were. In transportation, the bow was generally taken unstrung. I'm not going to unstrung this one because I don't want to swing it up again. Placed in a leather or canvas sack and strung across the back in that fashion there. It was hung quite high because after all, you didn't want it sticking to the ground. Unlike some of the Robin Hood movies I'm sure you've all seen, um, they put them over their shoulder like this and they run around like merry men now, what happens when you put a bow around your chest like this, is it slides very slowly like this. And then the next step you take, the bow digs into the ground, you go head over tip, and you hit the deck. It's no good at all. And you can't get off your head. <laughs> the bow capable of? In the hands of a good archer, a bow could be cast, cast an arrow in excess of 200 yards using the long bodkin point, which I'll show you later, which is the heaviest point of the day. This had the capability of doing some pretty nasty things, believe you me. The long bodkin could break through plate steel, chainmail links, Jacket to the side and the body. At 200 yards, it's not a great deal of weight to be away from the enemy. But it was long enough. 
One of our greatest, so they tell us, chroniclers, Gerald Conventus, or Geraldus Conventus, who travelled throughout Wales, he was just given the title of Gerald of Wales, wrote about the siege of Abergavenny Castle, when he saw archers shooting the shade thrown at Elmbow, <coughs> cast arrows after two men at arms who were retreating into the castle, into a door. The door was made of solid oak. The arrow tips were felt to protrude through the door. The door was as wide as my hand. To give you some idea of how powerful this weapon is. Gerald took the Conventus also took a testimony from one William de Brossier, a March and Knight, who was later hung by um, Llewellyn the Great, Llewellyn Bauer, for being a bit naughty with his wife. Um, he made testament that he saw two of his men return to, return to their camp after being shot by archers using such a bow. The arrows had pierced through the plate armour of their legs, through the chain mail, and burst into their thighs. But it gets better than that. It continued into the saddle, into that part which is called the alpha, and into the horse, striking it in mortal wound. In such agony, the horse reeled around, and the knight was pinned once again, almost identically, the other leg, causing him a mighty bit of discomfort. <laughs> I always wonder how the hell he got off the horse himself. <laughs> how will the animal die, just in case it was interested? So what of the man who shot the boat? The long woman. The medieval archer, during the 1300s, up to the middle of the 1300s, wasn't given the respect that he duly deserved. His capabilities were first noted by Edward I, who started to use them en masse, but they did not really come into their own until Edward III, who did insist that all archers be not only armed with basic protection, but also would have tabards so that they may be recognised in the field, and would also have a sword, a maul, or a buckled shield. One of the two. One of the three. Only in the later Middle Ages did practical recognition come through. The bow in war, especially by the French, was seen as a weapon of lesser men to only be used for hunting. Nobles used it for hunting because it was a hip and trendy thing to do. But in war, it was not fair. At this time, to do combat with your enemy, it was to get face to face with him and see his eyes when he shoved his sword into the boot. It wasn't to stand 200 yards away with a stick and like, let him scream into the floor with a bug through his chest. <coughs> Edward III made the longbow his mainstay. <coughs> Not only did he do this, but he also insisted that practice was made. He also insisted on discipline. He made his archers flank either side of his armies, and he had great control over them. Some people say that Edward I was the father of the longbow. I would dispute that and say that Edward III was, because Edward I was a, he was a git. <laughs> who really didn't respect anything other than himself and his purse. Throughout the realm, during Edward III's reign, it was now compulsory to put all other games and pastimes aside in favour of archery practice. Royal statutes were passed in the years of 1363, 1388, saying all labours shall have bow and arrow, and shall practice with the same on Sundays and holidays, laying aside all other such opportune games such as football, coils, tennis, bowls, and dice.
Faye, we know need the bow above all else in this time of England's need. This was the day of the peasant, the day that he could raise his social status, earn a great deal of money at war if he should survive, rob and loot the fields to help his own protection, and lift his family out of the quagmire the society at this time had put him into. He could no longer be charged with manslaughter if he happened to kill somebody on a Sunday while practicing. Don't like him, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so sue me. <laughs> Once again, if he was particularly good, he was given the right to bear his own for advance and raised to that of a mercenary or, even better, one of the royal, many royal companies. The archers paid up to sixpence a day. This skill compared to that of the worthy trade at this time, of a ploughman, a highly respected trade, who was paid between two and three pence a day. This was a truly professional fighting man. He took great care of his weapons. He looked after them, he waxed his strings regularly. He cropped his hair short, not like you see in these movies with a bit of long flowing hair, you know. What if the wind is blowing the wrong direction, you know? <laughs> if I had some hair, I'd show you. <laughs> with short hair, this was not likely to disturb his aim. There was nothing to get in the way. It was also far more convenient if we happened to find a chainmail hood on the battlefield. The hair wouldn't get wrapped up in any armour that he happened to be wearing. If you ever wear, if any of you here get a chance to wear a chainmail hood with long hair, it can be a pig. Because your hair gets wrapped up in the links. In action, the archer stood steady in his position not swayed, not moved by anything, because he was disciplined. And he was Welsh. <laughs> there was no point in running away to be caught by some local French levies and later taken away for incarceration. He stood his ground and was prepared to die where he stood. Unlike in the movies, once again, where you see these cute little back quivers, thrown over their backs, sort of, I'm going to shoot the enemy with that. Doesn't work. You cannot draw an arrow quick enough from a back quiver. Especially the back quivers of the day. Where's it gone? The only form of quiver that was worn on the back was this. It is a completely enclosed tube made out of canvas or leather. It protects the arrows from the weather. This was carried to battle. These arrows wasn't carried in our cart, and the archer had to take his own, and this was carried to battle. When he got to the battlefield, the boys would bring arrows to him to resupply him. His arrows he would stick into the ground in front of him so that he may only draw, shoot, draw another arrow, and shoot again. The rate of fire was such that by the time he was knocking his fourth arrow, his first arrow was hitting the ground or hit the target. As for his clothing, well, if he wasn't lucky enough to have been provided by his local county with everything that he needed, then he would steal it. He'd find some poor noble or mercenary or knight, stick his knife in his guts and steal his chain mail. I'm not being gross when I say that, because that's the way that it was. Mastery of the longbow depends not on strength of arm. By no way does it depend on that. The whole body is in use when you shoot the longbow properly because everything that you do must be in balance. 
People were taught to shoot the bow from the early ages of seven. Slowly increasing the weight of the bow until they were able to pull what we consider a war bow, which is anywhere between 80 pounds weight in this position to 160 pounds weight documented. And I'd like to see the guy who pulled that. <laughs> He must also be capable of sustaining 12 to 15 arrow arrows shot in roughly about the space of a minute, for at least seven minutes, eight minutes, before you would have any break whatsoever. Now if there's any archers here, they'll know to shoot as quick as you can, as hard and far as you can, is bloody tiring. And it's very difficult. These people were also incredibly accurate. There was documented evidence of people being able to hit a man target in excess of 150 paces consistently with at least 10 hours out of 12. And if they couldn't, they would not be raised to the status of a royal company of archers. We do have documentation of Warbo shooting a bodkin arrow in excess of 300 yards. Now that's as far as a lot of rifles today are accurate. The bow, as you notice, is for all intents and purposes a stick. Nothing else on it. It has no sights. The archer who shoots his bow sights with his heart. We call it instinctive shooting. The general idea is to draw back the string, stare hard at the target, and to let it go. And anybody who shoots his bows will tell you, you shoot a damn sight better when somebody's really got you riled up. When somebody annoys you, you shoot really well. <laughs> Don't you? <Jeff. laughs> <laughs> But please, don't think so highly of such an archer. Not only with these statutes of putting all these games aside in force, but such was the need for archers that the prisons were empty. Thieves, vagabonds, rapists, murderers, cutthroats. <laughs> No, actually, the, the, the only few names that we have recorded of uh, foul and evil buggers being let loose are actually English, which doesn't surprise me in the slightest. <laughs> let us then show you how an archer was dressed. Meet Wayne. Hi, Wayne. Now, in the most basic form that he would be. <coughs> but 
Wayne's a seasoned archer. He's been out in, on a few campaigns. And one day, while he was walking along the battlefield in front, he happened to see some knight who had... Gosh, he'd fallen off his horse. <laughs> 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 so Wayne walked up and said, Are you OK? And just happened to slip and his dad sort of slit his gizzard and unfortunately he died. So anyway. Oh, so Wayne thought, well, if he's dead he won't be needing us anymore, so I'll take it. So he took it home and he made a few alterations because he's got a big belly. Now he's looking the business now. He's got a hole. Back, stand up straight. Rust. These are the holes that the uh, last occupant happened to find. Um, he's now armed in chain mail. There's not a chance in hell that he could have afforded this. <laughs> this would have cost him, even on his princely sum, at least a year's wages. Second hand. But he got it for nothing second hand, which is right. <laughs> now the beautiful thing about chain mail is he's just raised his life expectancy in the field by about fifty percent. Chain mail stops oops. Stops the cutting blow. <laughs> oh! Oh! <laughs> And that is what it's designed for. This will stop a cut. But that's all. <laughs> if he happened to be wearing underneath this a tunic which was made of felt, then it would stop a broad-headed arrow. Because felt is an incredibly good medium to stop arrows. So we'll pretend he's wearing the felt. <laughs> Just pick it up. Should he now be shot? Come here. Oh. <laughs> I like this bit. Should he now be shot with a broad headed arrow? It will hit the lakes because they've all been riveted closed. It will hit the lakes, hit the, the felt tunic, probably give him one hell of a bruise. And drop out. So he's a happy jumper now. <laughs> Unfortunately, the armourers of the day understood this problem. So what they did, because it wasn't just people like Wayne wearing chainmail, you've got to remember the local mercenaries, professional soldiers, and knights on, were wearing chainmail as well. So instead of making the swords razor sharp during this period, it had an edge, not particularly a sharp one, but an edge. Lots more weight left in the blade. Also, you remember the trudest, truder forms of iron of the day. So now, if I hit him with this, I can't cut him. Nearly there. I can't cut him, but I'm going to break his bones. <laughs> During the medieval period, the only doctors were called quacks. <laughs> Mainly because they used to walk around with a great big bag of herbs and spices on their face so they wouldn't catch anything off you. Also, Wayne goes to the guy and says, Ah, oh, this big ugly git just smashed my chest in and left you. And I'm bleeding to death internally. What can you do for me? Hang on, I'll get the leeches. That's about all he gets hoped for. So Wayne's now off to battle. Thank you, Wayne. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wayne's off to battle. He's got his long bow. Very long bow, yeah. Uh, let's find him. There you go. And he's using some nice arrows, which he would slide under the belt that he hasn't got. <laughs> Come on, get it ready. Now, the way that you see him place the arrows into his belt now is very period. This is the way that they used to do it. A few arrows, not too many, up to eight. 
will be placed through a loop in the belt. From this position, they are very accessible. They are out of the way of running, because you need to be able to run. And he's ready to take on the world. Anyway. Right. We know, yeah. Right on, yeah. yeah. Stop in the world. <laughs> this is probably, once again, quite a basic thing. During the later half of the 1400s, chain mail was probably becoming quite a basic commodity to an archer because they killed so many friends on the battlefield and stolen it. They probably all had one, you know? Right, take them out of there. So Wayne's heard this little tale of that felt. And he had a little chat with his missus, and she shot the cat with the bowl, of course. <laughs> Slaughtered it, chewed the leather, made it soft. <laughs> Put a few plates within, lined it throughout. <laughs> Got one of the arm holes. <laughs> it doesn't bend that way. <laughs> now he's ready. He now stands about 70% more chance than he had before. Compared to a knight, he's got no chance. But for an archer, he's now getting pretty well equipped. His status would be a lot higher. By this time, he would be something like a corporal. Rice, belted, leather tunic, chain mail. He's doing the business now. He's now in a position that he can shoot anybody. And should they get close to him, he can take steps. Bloody big ones, that way. <laughs> <laughs> but this is not the only way that he went to battle. Not only did he have little arrows here. <laughs> but he also carried one of these. The rondel. Long blade, quite thin, and a flat end. It has a reason. Let's show how Chain mail. Chain mail. <laughs> Chain blooming mail. Check the glitch. Chain. Can you all see that hole? What? Yeah? Even the best manufacturer of chain mail cannot close that hole up. Because if they do, the man wearing it can't move. <laughs> you can't lift an arm to hide this. Now he's an archer, so he needs loads. But even a knight needs loads of room to move. So that hole's always going to be there. This, should he come upon a knight upon the field, who is totally encompassed in armour, the only vulnerable point he has to kill him, not to wound him, that's just been an Englishman that have to be wicked like that. <laughs> it's a striking under the armpit, and that's why the flat is there. Something that you can physically strike without hurting your hand. This would be slapped into the body cavity, twisted around a bit, dead. He has one the other side. The second vulnerable point would be this portion here, or if he's not wearing a gorget, the throat here. More than likely, during the French Army this period, is the eye slot. But again, the knife is placed, foot on the chest, just to make sure, into the eye slot, and hold. The third, <laughs> the most entertaining, <laughs> the one that gives you 
the best tone <laughs> is to be placed here, as it feels cold, <laughs> and struck through the groin and vigorously launched from side to side in a hope to cut the main femoral artery. Oh, it's great. <laughs> An interesting point while well, Wayne gets ready is this was also called the mercy blow and is where the word mercy comes from today. This was also known as a mercy dagger. Amongst the Sarawak orders, if a knight was mortally wounded on the field and didn't fancy spending another week festering and dying of septicemia and getting leeched to death by some quack. He would get hold of his brother knight and say, give me mercy. And when he would take out his rommel and dispatch him in one of these three fashions. And that's what we should do to each other. Friend. <laughs> so he's got his rommel. Mainly that's his, uh, his little, you know, that's his insurance. It's like, I can steal more armour then. He's got his arrows, which we're not even going to bother putting back on. Very common for the archer was this. A very well used buckle of shield. <laughs> it's held in this fashion here. It was not used to take a direct blow because it was too light, but it was used to parry sword blades away to give them a chance. This came in towards the end of the 14th century. Before then, the archers would just run like bloody hell. This buckler would be their last ditch defense against a heavily armored, incredibly well trained knight that probably didn't offer them a great deal still. Another necessity is the axe. Otherwise known as a maul. In a lot of circumstances, this had a hammer. Almost, if you can imagine today, a large wedge of steel here looked like a hammer. And it was literally used to smash in helmet by sheer weight of blow. It was also used, of course, for sharpening the stakes which were used to break up the horse attacks replaced a few yards in front of the arches. So he's got his axe generally fitted to the back where it's not going to get in the way. He's shooting a very high powered bow. Trouble shooting a bow of this kind is that should it catch your skin, the string will probably take out a number of veins or even arteries. An infection during the battle campaign was generally fatal. It was the biggest killer, the infection. So, to protect the forearm from the string, a bracer, generally made of leather, but sometimes also made of bone, was used. They come in many different forms and types. Some are nothing but a little tiny strip which covers this part of the arm. But in the majority, the leather encompassment because it's easier. <coughs> Isn't it, Wayne? Yeah. <laughs> so, this we have the image of a Welsh archer. I was up that snack. <laughs> Now, if Wayne happened to be very, very good at his trade, it's quite likely that he would be noticed. And if he should do good worth, then it was like, you know, it was quite likely that he could be raised in his status. And made into a captain, or as we have two accounts of archers actually being knighted, while I'm being William Jodwell, the Cheshire Archer, 
and Harold Akrabid of Welsh Archer from Mid Wales. Now, <laughs> a lot of people have said to us, What do you mean they were knighted? Show me proof, show me written evidence. There isn't any. The reason that there isn't any is because people get confused with what knighted actually was. You've got a bunch of pompous gits who sat up in the Tower of London talking nicely to the king who were then given the right to call themselves Sir Knight and don gold spurs to their heels and look very pretty and pompous but never ever go to war. Then there were those commanders who were close to the king who were Sir Knighted and did do good service. But there's a definite distinction here between those that had wealth and came from good family and were knighted and those who crawled from the gutter and were knighted. For somebody like Wayne, knighted would not be a sir, knighted. it would not be a peerage, but it would be a command. And he would, with no reservation whatsoever, and would fully just right to be able to call himself a knight of the realm. This generally meant that he had proved himself in battle and was allowed, therefore, to command men, no matter how many, how few, or how large that force may be. The reason that there's no documentation is because they were never surnighted, and because of their lowly background, was not allowed to be raised to the rank of Sir Knight. But they were knights. They were knights of the field. These were the people who went out and did the job. So we just had mega promotion. Yeah. He's got a sword because his status has now gone to the roof. He's now donning his own coat of arms on a felt or cotton wadded chair. Buckle to the side for ease, chain mail, but that's not the end of it because Wayne's a thief of it. He can't help it anymore. <laughs> We're not going to put it on him, but I'll go on. Um, Who's breathing? <laughs>
so you still have full articulation or mobility. As you'll notice, this has an incredible amount of articulation. It allows itself to pull in. After a short time, the wearer can't even feel he's got it on. Unlike tournament armour, which most of our records are based on, this armour will twist. This now allows Wayne, who's going to do a left and right handed draw, put together. Draw the bow. As you can see in this position, this plate has rolled out of the way. These plates have rolled to the back. The rondel has slipped slightly backwards, just out of reach of the string. Draw with the other hand. Draw further back than that. Thank you. <laughs> so, as you can see now, the lanes here have slid under the main shoulder lane. The elbow cup is fixed. The leather still can still not be attacked, and it is out of his way. It is all slid away easily without any extra effort for his muscles to exert. So that's noisy, but very effective indeed. So now Wayne can stand blows from swords, well at least one blow. Battle armour of this period, we found, has only been made to withstand no more than two blows in the same place. By that time it's so dinted and smashed out of proportion it's just unreal. Tournament armour, however, was designed to take multiple blows because, after all, that's what they were there for, to get beaten stupid. <laughs> You can sit down. Give him a clap. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass two broad headed arrows amongst you. Please don't walk off with them. Stab yourself in there. If you'd like to quickly have a look at them, get a better chance to look at them after and pass them amongst yourselves. While they're being passed around, I'd like to open up now for any questions on what we've covered so far. Yeah. Bad question. <laughs> <laughs> Felt is a hell of a lot more effective than silk, but the damn tight heavier to wear. I presume that you've uh, looked into the book on the Mongol Empire, yeah. who believed that wearing silk, and I hasten to say believed, because it's untested, they believed that wearing silk would help them, because should an arrow hit their chest and pierce the rest of their clothing, then it would push into their body, twisting as it went, yeah? Entering their body and taking the silk, which was lighter, so that when they come to take the arrow out, they would slowly pull the arrow and the silk together, which would stop the barbs of the arrow digging into the flesh. Not. <laughs> you imagine putting a piece of silk around one of those arrows when you get to it, and just put it in your hand and pull it backwards. A flesh sucks. But then inside the body it's incredibly hard to get out. That's even a straight blade, never mind it with barbs. So when you try to pull it out, it's not going to go. Despite the fact that now it does not twist either. Over something like a 50 yard radius the arrow will turn perhaps twice. So I don't <coughs> personally believe the theory but it's a nice one. I'd like to test it. <laughs> Tunic, 
he's in the dead pocket at the moment. Um, this would be rammed down into tubes within the tunic that are released into the tubes here to form profound ribs. And this was excellent against arrows. The one interesting thing about one of these is they're far more effective against arrows than they are against swords. Because even if you're wearing this kind of tunic, you get a good wallop with the sword. God, it hurts. So, wool was also used in the same fashion. Small pieces of wool, like the fluff almost, was rammed into tubes. Is that answer your question? Yeah, was, was the cotton or the wool felt better? Which was better? I wouldn't know. <laughs> to be quite honest, it's probably about the same because the, what documentation I've read on it, it it's basically, you know, it, it's quite even. I've not seen any reference to either. Any more? Oh. <laughs> it depends what kind of arrow. I mean, that's a fair point, yes. It's interesting you should say that because there is an actual record of um, a quack <laughs> getting all the local blacksmith forming a small lozenge of metal, the same diameter of the arrow, breaking up the feathers, holding the arrow, fastening the lozenge of metal a piece of wire to the wood, yeah? and then pushing the arrow through the body with the lozenge of metal following it except the lozenge had been heated to cherry red. The idea being to cauterize the room because it went through. Did the patient live? I don't know. <laughs> I think it was written by the crack so we'll never know. <laughs> Sir? I have a question on the chain mail. You say that the was there. A square patch of chain could have been linked to that. Did anybody attempt that or is there any documentation? It's a damn good thought, but there is no documentation on it whatsoever. What you have to remember is there's so much mobility of movement in the arm. Should you link a chain here? I mean, to be quite honest, I would think there was... position, you put a patch on it. When you bring it down, you get back. Yeah, but when you bring it down, that's going to press your arm here. The chain mail doesn't fold away like cloth. And I'm sure that it had that of work that they would have done it. Because yeah. earlier in 1066, the Normans used to have a, a square of chain mail here, which is a great little argument as to what it's for. Some believed it was extra protection for the heart area, and others believed it was lifted over the face. Personally, I believe it was for the face protection. Because it makes more sense. But as for the extra bag there, I don't know. There's no documentation of that whatsoever. So, they were very resourceful, and I would have thought that should that have worked, then it would have been documented and used throughout. Well, uh, absolutely. Any more? What kind of battery is used in the chain mail? Whatever they had. I would have thought it's for a very crude form of iron, which is stretched out into a long wire, bound around a, an iron bar into almost like a spring and then the links would be flipped off. Each end of the link, which that has then formed, would be hammered flat, a small hole pierced in each side. They would then be overlapped and a rivet placed through it. As for what kind of metal, um, speak to a metallurgist, because I don't think that we are capable of reproducing the type of metal that we have then. It wasn't very good. Or very good. It depends how much carbon they've actually been beaten into it because they didn't understand about carbon at this time. Does that answer your question? Okay. There's a lady up there. Oh. Uh, so what was it you said about the tips that are made of horn? Yeah, the tips of the bow are made of deer horn, and they were sharpened. Point being that in a press, the archer could use it, but I'm glad you told me that. Huh? Oh. The archer could use it as a form of spear, wedged into the ground behind his foot so as to stop a cavalry charge not really, but really to spike the horse yeah? failing all of that he could have used it as a two-ended pike staff four staff with points on either end <coughs> yeah? it was an offensive weapon it was a last ditch attempt but if all that failed he could like sudden out next
Considering that, that a great deal of the Rico Bowl was seen, however, which was very accessible to um, I don't know. I know that the Saracen Bowl was very effective, but during the Crusades, there was many, many accounts of Crusaders returning to their camps looking like porcupines or hedgehogs because they're wearing their thick felt jackets and their arrows that have been shot at them are sticking out all over the place. <laughs> get them gates wider, come on. <laughs> I've got to get in here, yeah? I don't know why. They, they well, are, I, heard, I heard this thing would, like, has a whole lot more momentum and uh, the recurve, so because it was so short, I'm thinking Costain's the Black Rose. He got into that. The recurve didn't have the range and didn't have the. And but I didn't. I haven't quite got that figured out how or why. I don't know you did. The world record at the moment for casting an arrow is held by a recurve bow. So what he's telling me is a load of twaddle. They would probably shoot an arrow as far as a longbow during the period, if not further. The recurve is an explosion of energy, whereas the longbow is a push. There is a reason why the recurve bow was not as effective as the longbow, and it had nothing to do with the bow, and more to do with the development of arrows and how they were fitted to the shaft. But I shall come on to that in just a second. Is there anybody else? The cars. Uh, just a comment, when the, when the recurve bow used more on horseback, than where a longbow would get too big, too long, and on horseback. So they tell us, but I'm sure I could shoot the bow off horseback. Having sat on a, on a great big huge destrier only a couple of weeks ago, I'm sure that I could have shot a bow off it. But you are right, a recurve is far more comfortable to shoot off a bow back. And the Saracens and their way of life depended greatly on the horse because of the unforgiving nature of the desert. So I'm sure that's why they developed the recurve in that fashion. <coughs> In specific thicknesses? Uh, 12 gauge, 16, 20 gauge. About 18. 18 gauge. That's about as thick as armor would have been for war. What people forget is that there's thousands and thousands of documents in armor, and I have hundreds of people going to me every year saying, you're talking a complete load of twat. Armor was at least 16 gauge covering the breastplate. It was 18 gauge on the legs, and it was thinner, and, and they go with this whole spiel, and I sit back and they carry on. Can you honestly imagine going into battle with armour, thinking of stop armour, which has to be at least 16 gauge? Right? Armour 13 gauge size. What I'm saying is, if you were going on a, on a long campaign, I'm not going to play. Exactly, that's my point. We often hear about knights being winched onto their horses and things. Absolutely true during tournaments, because their armour was so thick and bloody heavy that they had to be winched onto the horse. Also, a lot of it was fixed rivet, as in metal to metal. And once you were in that fixed position, it was the slight movement just to move the tilt in. <coughs> and it was just ran me like that. The thing is, when you go to war, if you're in the middle of a bloody field campaign, which has mud in excess of a foot, two foot deep, right? You can think how tired you're gonna get. So you want armor that is going to stop blows, give you as much protection as it can without imposing too great a limit upon your mobility. So armor during, for usable war armor, it was a lot thinner than what we see in the later period. You have to also remember that an archer shooting at a knight has to be within a, an angle of 15 degrees because the curvature of the breastplate will force an arrow to glance off. A 15 degrees when some great big knights come in charge of George is not a great deal. So by curvature and by fluting and, and different ways of forming the metal, these are the ways they try to get around using thicker metal. But it was 18 gauge during the 14th century. You also remember that this was the real beginnings of full body encompassment of armor. Okay. Well, running back to the recurve club, uh, well, actually, back to the recurve club, uh, just came to my thought. Had the, the Saracens and the Turks using the thumb grip and the thumb grip. Has the uh, English book, the long book, changed in anything? The uh, standard drum now is three fingers, and they were they using two, one, the whole body hand? A lot of people say that 
And it is very easy to use two fingers. It's quite painful when you get to heavy bows. It is far more comfortable to use three fingers, especially on a heavier bow. And you can sustain shooting greater with three fingers. So I would say from actually doing it, that three fingers is so. I've tried the thumb grip. And unless you're brought up to it, my God, that's painful. You feel like your joints are about to just pop out. It really is painful. So I would say three fingers and a heavier bow than two fingers. It's, it's quite common to use two fingers. I don't know. It's hard to say from the, the different types of artists we have at this time. Any more questions before we move on? Sir? On the three finger draw, um, I've heard that the three finger split finger, the arrow between the first leg finger was common, and that three fingers under was never used. I've heard other people say that sometimes three fingers under the arrow was used. Do you have any comments on that? Not a clue. Not a, I literally, I mean, I've tried, but you're talking about string walking, actually. If anybody doesn't know, that's the, the method of putting all your fingers above or below the arrow to give you uh, a difference in cast. If you're shooting shorter, you walk the fingers down and you can the range you raise your fingers up. Um, I don't know, all I can say is that you were very, very skilled bowmen indeed at the time. And to say that they didn't do it, I couldn't say that either. It's just one of those things that we'll never know. It makes sense to do it if it works. It doesn't work for me, but I know people that works very well for me. Okay. Sir? Is there ever any experimentation with mechanical releases? <laughs> Not during the 14th century, no. Not at all. I personally don't like mechanical releases, because um, I do know people that use them to great effect. But that is a very modern thing indeed. The only form of mechanical release that you could really, well, you can't that, was the Saracen thumb grip, which was a ring on the thumb for the release. But that's something I don't really want to get into. Okay. question about arrows. Do you have any documentation on full flesh, two flesh, or no flesh? None whatsoever. Once again, it's a very sketchy area. Um, the only thing I can say is that if you need to shoot arrows very, very quickly, a four fletch is a wonderful piece of equipment. Because you don't have to turn the damn thing around. There's a few people who actually don't understand what you're talking about. So, when an arrow is fletched in the traditional way, it has one cock fletch there and two flat fletches. Sure. When, the string, when this is fitted to the string, the two flat fletches run along the side of the bow. If you fit it the wrong way round, the cock fletch forces the arrow to skid off at the wrong angle. When you try to pick an arrow and thinking about the amount of arrows you're talking about and to a couple of million arrows made for the battles in France, I can't see bogeys making them all with you know, two different colours, the cock fletches in black and the other two in white. You know? They'd probably just drop them all in the one colour. Yeah? What about push don't know. I would say not. I mean, if you imagine the primitive blues at the time, think of the time we'd have tried to hold an arrow on at the perfect angle of twist. Yeah? But your four fletch, and I agree with because it's far easier to pick an arrow up with four fletch and just stick it to the string, you don't even have to look at it. So that may well have been, but we have no evidence for it whatsoever. The difficult thing is, as I say, um, all the fletchings on the railroads perished. Now, we don't know. We really don't know. Is that all? Right, the arrow that you've seen coming around there was a broad-headed arrow. What I'm going to pass along you now is two types of bodkin arrows. While they're being passed around, I'll tell you a little bit about the arrows. Arrows during the medieval period were commonly made of up to 15 <coughs> kinds of wood. These included Brazil wood, which actually came from India and Persia and so through to Europe throughout the Middle Ages. Just as a footnote to that, 
Later on, they imported the wood to Brazil, and this is where the country of Brazil gets its name from the Brazil wood that was sent there. Some other types of wood that were actually used were hard beam or horn beam, birch, ash, oak, blackthorn, beech, or poplar, which was aspen, to name but a few of the better arrows of the day. The majority, or the favoured arrow that we, we seem to, to come across is ash, because it gives just the right amount of weight without being too heavy which allows it to have a greater cast to strike its target at a greater distance, but still with that extra weight, it gives the better penetration through plate steel. There is, however, one arrow remaining from the medieval period in England, which is probably a medieval arrow, but they can't quite pin it down. And it is the property of the Dean of the Chapter of Westminster, and it was found in 1828 on the Abbey Roof. There you go. It's that manslaughter rule again. It was made of ash, and the head of the arrow was actually, well, you can see it from here, was that, which, according to the Mary Rose records, was the most popular type of arrow. Type 16 of the towers on the collection. The arrow was spine rated at approximately 150 pounds draw weight. That is to say that the arrow would have flown better from a bow which was 150 pounds to draw. Now, it's not to say that the medieval Fletchers of the day, who was once again an incredibly skilled trade, were not capable of spine rating their arrows because they could. They knew what they were doing. Arrows were made specifically for weights of bows. If you make an arrow too flimsy, then it will fly at different angles. It will not fly true. If you make it too stiff for the bow to be shot out of, it will not fly true. You make it within 10 or 20 pounds correctly spined, then it will fly pretty straight. The broad headed arrows that you see were no longer used greatly in the field of battle after about the 13th century. This is because armour was being invented, coats of plates, that is a coat like this perhaps, or like the Raymond Graham before, with plates of steel fastened into it. A broad headed arrow against this, with chainmail underneath, became useless. It could not cut through and break into the body. However, against sheep, sorry, sheep, before you slip, against horses, and unarmoured men, it was excellent. Now that broad-headed arrow was a definite flesh-searing weapon designed to hack its way through your body or that of your horse. The bodkin, on the other hand, is specifically designed to break through plate steel. This arrow has four flat sides, not a particularly sharp point, but sharp enough. When struck, it hits a steel, warms up the point of impact, pierces the plate, folds it back to the four flat sides, bursts through the chain mail, the increased width of the bodkin breaks the link open before it crashes into the body, <laughs> breaking through the rib cage and piercing into you. <coughs> It was also very common to dip this thing in manure, human feces, or plague-ridden animals, just to make sure that your pested grew maggots and died. <laughs> Bodkins are lovely little toys. The only other arrow of any note is this one. Now, 
this is another tower from the specification arrow. Their official reason for this arrow is that it was designed to cut the rigging on ships. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell it was written by an Englishman, can't you? There's not many ships in Wales. If any of you, when you were children, tied a piece of rope between two trees and thought, yeah, we'll cross it like this, you'll notice that even no matter how hard you tried to get that rope tight, there was always a sag in it. Yeah? Consider the weight of an arrow stave. Consider the velocity. When that hits rigging, I don't care if it's a Wilkinson's blade, <laughs> right? When that hits rigging, it's going to take up any slack that's in that rope first, which is going to reduce about 90% of the inertia of that arrow at least. And then it's going to go and hit the deck. If anyone's ever tried to cut a piece of hemp, horsehair, rope, you'll know it's a damn hard thing. You're never going to do it. So that is a complete and utter crop. However, we do know people that have tested this on sheep. <laughs> they also tested this on the sheep. And this on the sheep. And this. Now out of all these arrows, the one arrow that worked best on the body of a sheep was the one made to cut through. <laughs> the other arrows stuck into the body cavity a few extruded through the cavity out the other side. This was shot at approximately 50 paces with a bow about 65 pounds of This arrow went into the sheep, through the sheep, out of the sheep, and carried them going. That is a flesh weapon. That is specifically designed for horses. You shoot a horse with that, it's not going to carry a fully armoured knife very far. That hits the bone, nerves, veins, arteries, it gathers and it cuts. I like horse. You'll notice one of the arrows that's being passed amongst you now is a little bit thick. Who's got it right now? They won't go back. Just hold that up. Now if anybody hasn't seen that, that is very thick indeed. Now that is the thickness of the arrows that were found on the Mary Rose. These arrows are a bit thinner. Through experimentation we found that that doesn't fly half as far as this. Considering the skill of the Fletcher, Who's to say they didn't make that kind of arrow for ship-to-ship -ship combat and this kind of arrow for battlefield combat? After all, ship-to-ship, -ship, once you get within 100 yards, you've had it. There's no evasive manoeuvres. You're going to smash together, throw a grapple and iron down and come and fight. That thickness is better for field battles. But there is a reason behind the thickness of that one. And the fact that on the main road, this kind of arrowhead as you can't see, it has wings shorter than that, but similar, except they've been hammered to close against this piece here. That, fitted to that arrow, becomes a very deadly ship to ship weapon because it has a gap in here. If they hadn't wanted that gap in there, they would have just forged the whole thing in one piece, which would have been far into it. You can tie a form of Greek fire, pitch or tar, through the wings, through them gaps. That arrow, extra weight, a lot more inertia, a lot more impact. You shoot that ship to ship, when that hits an oak beam, the extra weight of that arrow is going to fall <coughs> it right into the oak timbers, which will push anything that's in their wings out onto the top of the timber. Because it's got little notches here, 
if that should go through the top surface of the timber, it will drip and you will not be able to pull it out. What will happen from then is your ship burns down. Yeah? Because that thickness of arrow, you consider how big a bodkin would have to be upon that to make a big enough hole in a plate steel breastplate to allow the rest of the arrow to penetrate. Gentleman made an interesting point about the Saracen bows and why they didn't have as much effectiveness against plate steel as English arrows did. A very, very simple idea which seems in most to only be taken up in England. The armies of England used to make their steel into a tube here and the arrow was fitted into the tube. Most of the medieval nations made the arrow with a tang or a flat blade which was then slotted into the wood and the wood found. When that hit its target, the arrow hit and pushes with all its weight. When an arrowhead with a tang hits its target, energy finds the easiest path. What's softest, wood or steel? You hit a steel plate, that arrow's just going to back its way right up the stage. It's not going anywhere. And that's so is why Middle Eastern arrows were not as effective as the English arrows. Each of the arrows have little cuts in them here. It's quite often that they would actually insert into this piece of wood here a piece of horn or leather. This was to prevent the wood from splitting when the string struck it and sent it on its way. The reason that the fletches are all bound, because that's the evidence we have that they were bound, and considering the glues of the day, they probably have to bind them to hold them in place for three days with a glue set. I also made sure they didn't fly off. At this point, because we've covered quite a large subject there, I'd like to ask if anyone has any questions. Back to the cross talk. <laughs> 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 yes, sir. What about the cross the, uh, the reason why they were both in use at about the same time as the cross bow was what did the, you know, the uh, the Grey Goose Cloud and the Whistling Death and all that stuff, it, it didn't work with the crossbow, the way I was saying. It didn't work with the crossbow because the crossbows were on the long, low ground and the long bows were on the high ground. If it had been switched, the crossbows would have been working better than the long bows. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's a good theory. But um, crossbows of the day, it's a difficult question. Crossbows is not something that I've read a lot into because I have no interest in whatsoever. The other thing is about a crossbow is it didn't take much of a person to be able to shoot the damn thing. That's why it was remained a banned weapon by the Pope longer than the bow was. The bow took a very skilled archer to shoot it. And he had to practice a long, long time. But also, the main reason that the bow was better than the crossbow was the sheer rate of fire. The best crossbowman in the land could probably, if he's lucky, put five bolts out in a minute. With greater accuracy. No, not necessarily, not when you shoot an quick. Also remember the trigger mechanisms of the day and the sighting mechanisms of the day. I mean, it's only now that we have decent sights and crossbows and can start hitting our targets properly with them. Now, if you talk about, sorry, professional people probably could, they would practice with it. The other thing is with the bow, is they could shoot 12 hours minimum a minute, with accuracy, the same level. So what would you rather have, a bow or a crossbow? Because if I was sat one end of a field with a crossbowman, and I had a bow, 
I know that I would win. Because I'm putting three hours into him by the time he shot one of me. At least. And that is why I think the bow was more pre preferable. It was also a cheaper weapon to replace. Very cheap. And that's why there's no records of them today. We've got lots and lots of medieval crossbows. Yeah? It broke, but I'll, it's such a nice little thing, and I'll put it away in the cupboard. The bow broke, I thought it was fine. <laughs> Damn thing. <laughs> it hurt me. Did <laughs> you keep it? <laughs> Anybody else? Sir, the fletchings, were they treated or were they just uh, glued to the shaft? Please define to me. Um, were they just taken clean and then put on the shaft or did they soak them and stiff them up? Or? I would say not. We know that there's only four fletches, four feathers on each goose wing that can be used. And they're the primary flight feathers. So if you think that the orders were going out for over a million arrows, God, that's a lot of geese. <laughs> Eight feathers per goose. So, do the European archers die in sustaining their goose? <laughs> As soon as you uh, moved on to the question of uh, diet, breakfast, campaign breakfast, salted herring, bread, probably stale, beer. They wished no matter what family they came from, they wished to say no 
and they could say that. Whereas in England it was like killed to which is told. That's true for all cults, Scottish, Irish, and Welsh. See, we're civilized. I know it's actually big dogs. Especially that one. Any more questions? Why the different likes of the bodkins? We have long bodkin and we have a short bodkin. From what we do, which we could call the form of experimental archaeology, we find that at longer range the long bodkin pierces better than it does at shorter range and vice versa. The short bodkin doesn't carry it as true a flight over longer range as the long bodkin does and it doesn't have as much penetration. That's the reason for the long and short bodkin. Any more questions? Is your company um, getting other colleges and other, other demonstrations throughout the country, throughout the continent here, or are you, or are you just coming here to one thing back home again? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't really want to answer that one right now, but just because I'm feeling a good mood at all. Uh, no, actually, we, we are here and for this specific demo. We'll be doing another demo tomorrow, to Woodbridge, and you should all be there. And we will be going home, but we are willing to do other demos in other parts of the US. We have asked, been asked already to do a tour next year in the US on the West Coast. But um, that's next year. There's a young man there wanted to ask me a question. Did someone ask me a question? Is your hair gone, mister? No more questions. Going once, going twice. So. English victory ever. The Battle of Cressy. The English army, after conducting themselves on a long and very tiring campaign through France, burning and ravishing and doing all kinds of weird wonderful things, because they're English. And the Welsh artists, of course, will be perfect gentlemen and not doing anything at all. <laughs> the English army were drawn up upon a small hill. They were trying to escape, but the French cut them off. Their numbers was approximately 13,000 strong. More than half of these were archers, probably well. Set in the typical formation of archers to the each flank, left and to the right, and the vanguard in the middle. In fact, on the right of centre, under the Earls of Warwick and Oxford, was the Black Prince himself, who was a young boy at this time, about 17 years old. And he was sort of the commander, if you like. So if I'll make the decisions, but the Earl of Warwick will just make sure that they're okay. On his left, the Earls of Arundel and Northampton on the left flank. The third battle line in the centre stood some way back and was held almost as if in reserve under the King's own personal command. He knew what he was doing, didn't he? I'll understand my view. <laughs> the baggage train was held into the rear of that, and each division was a phalanx. The men at arms flanked by archers, that is to say they were fighting on foot and not on horseback. Further protection was added because the archers dug holes and put great big spikes, great big holes sticking out, sharp at either end. The holes were designed to trip the horses and to break the charge. In contrast to this incredibly well disciplined and fabulous sport, came the French, who blundered, I quote, Fossiart the Chronicle, blundered onto the field, composed of some 12,000 heavy cavalry, 17,000 light cavalry, 6,000 mercenary Genoese 
cross the river. <laughs> 25,000 peasant levies who were basically stood on a hill with flags to go, hey, because the French didn't believe that peasants were allowed to take the field of battle. <coughs> The total massed army before the English was in a region of 60,000 men against 13,000. Yeah, kind of odds the French light. And still do. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Also riding with heavy horse cavalry was the flower of French chivalry, were the kings of Bohemia and Majorca. Their numbers are not counted in the figures that I've just given you. They had their own vanguard with them. Fossett gives us a good idea of the events that followed, and I think they're, they're quite amazing. The Genoese crossbowmen set forward towards the English line. In order to frighten the English, they shouted a massive roar stuck the papias, which is a shield, into the ground and hid behind it. <laughs> the English sort of went, hey, it's all foreign to me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> the Genoese uprooted the shields, took another few steps forward and gave another mighty roar. The English went, what? <laughs> Still undeterred, the Genoese advanced somewhat and gave out a third mighty charge of war. And with this, they let loose their crossbow bolts at the English. Unfortunately, it had been raining, and they hadn't took their strings off their crossbows. And therefore, their bolts, not all of their bolts, in fact, very few reached the English lines. The call was given out by the captains of archers, and the bows were drawn back, and the grey goose cloud the name given to the amount of arrows put into the air. In excess of 100,000 arrows in the air was written down upon them in any one minute. Each archer was putting three arrows into the air before the first one hit the ground. The Genoese were smoked through helm and arm and body alike. And in such terror and fear, cut the strings and run away. And the French king went, Sacre bleu! <laughs> for they block our path. You have to remember that the French were so hot-blooded that they were all saying, let me go, I want to fight them, let me go. And they <coughs> held them back to this point. And the king said, kill me those dotards, for they block our path. And the French went, yoo-hoo! And after that they went, on the way they swung their swords and slashed to death a few Genoese crossbowmen just because they didn't want to pay them later. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, they came into range with the English army. Sorry, the Welsh archers. Who continued their shooting and laid them into a hail of arrows such that smoke horse and man alike. Crashing to the ground before even reaching the front lines of the English. Laid into the mud, a gargling heap. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> Hang on, I've lost my place. <laughs> Seeing what had just happened, other members of the heavy cavalry thought, Oh my God, let me have a go! <laughs> <laughs> Charge in the game and the arrows went. I think because they were whistling, you see. Because we like to put a bit of extra fear into them. So little reeds are sometimes attached between the feathers, so when you shoot the arrows, they whistle. Just so the French can hear them coming. Oh! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and when they hit the deck and they all bounced on the other horses. The other French behind them looked in top of dismay and said, Can we play too? <laughs> so they all let it go. And the arrows came over again. And those are right, mate. <laughs> now, 
a few of the knights of France actually managed to reach the line to the Black Prince, this fractured. <laughs> and when they got there, more of the French piled on, and his ranks were very shortly pressed. So, fearing for his safety, the Earl of Warwick sent a message to the king. To, king, 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 your son's going to die. We're really hardly pressed. Can we have some of the reserves, please? Come on, you've done nothing all day. Get a few bucks. Stop moving the king. And let's have a go. And the king said, let the boy win his spurs this day. For it is, for if God wills it, the victory of this shall be his. In other words, sod off. <laughs> <laughs> so they went back. No help was sent. Now I hasten to add that we do have documentation that this was Welsh archers. And they did go give good fight. Hand to hand, they were said to be pulling the arrows out of dead bodies to shoot at more troops which were coming on. Irish and North Wales knifemen and spearmen were going up good. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. <laughs> they were all having a nice little play, pulling arrows out. The boys were risking life and limb in the battle line, pulling arrows and bringing them back to the archers. They were very hard pressed indeed. They pushed back this attack, and the French were queuing up to make it the church. <laughs> the French then called a halt and sent their heralds to the English lines and said, Look, this isn't fair, is it? How are we supposed to kill you if we can't get to you because all our dead bodies are in the way? <laughs> An hour and we'll have them all out of the way. Okay. It was said the bodies lay six feet deep. Man and horse alike. So, in they came and they moved some of the bodies out of the way. And then they lined up and they charged again. Seventeen times! <laughs> <laughs> Train chimpanzees from the Amazon are no better. <laughs> For God's sake, how many times have you got to be slaughtered? By this time, night was falling, and the French finally realised that there was nothing they could do. And they rambled and ambled and sort of crawled and sneaked their way off the field of battle in total and utter disgrace. In the middle of this, <laughs> The blind king had only asked for his best mate to strap his horse to his and charge at the ranks. I want to have a go at striking them English as well, <laughs> but they're all being killed. I don't care. I'm going to strike one. And fair news, he was found within a few feet of the English ranks, still strapped to his horse and his French horse. The French that day suffered 1,500 deaths of lords and knights. They lost no less than 30,000 of other ranks. The English? 200. Now I don't believe, I know that the facts speak for themselves. Had it not been for archery, had it not been for the longbow, for the bodkin arrow, the great goose cloud, that would be the total annihilation of the Welsh and English army. It's pretty easy for it. Sure. <coughs> they would have been slaughtered, but it was not because of the long run. I'd like to stop at this point because I believe we've run out of time. Very quickly, has anyone got any questions? Who was we quoted from there in the, the account from the battle? Jean Fossier. The Jean Fossier. This is Scott. Hey. I wanted to ask a question about that. Um, because I was reading some different accounts. I know Shakespeare um, counts Harry as as the king as having told his truth. Will not pillage the land. Uh, he hung a man for for, uh, uh, for uh, stealing from the church. I read another account. Uh, my library has 
break the village of Burgess way across as, as any of your own. Do you know? It, it, it was. was. Henry, Henry was like that. He was very much like that. Edward III, however, and Henry V are two of the campaigners who went to France who refused to allow that to happen. The only time that they burned the crop fields and caused any damage was when they were retreating from the French. Because they knew the French had such a massive vanguard that if you destroy all the food in the local area, you slow down their attack. Before that, what you have to remember is the, the English army at this time was claiming all these lands for their own. So what are you going to go and burn and destroy, and rape and pillage and steal from your own land? <clears throat> I mean, the, the only other person who have done that was uh, Richard the Lionheart in England. <laughs> you know? He only ever travelled to Britain twice. He couldn't speak English. And he, each time he came, it was to raise money for the Crusades. But, no, you are right. It was, Henry was a bit of a gift, and then he liked to do anything. He had no control of his troops because he didn't obtain as much respect as some other noted leaders. Any other questions? Sir? Do you ever run across any reference to a plan to uh, send longbows to the early English colonies in Virginia at the request? No. <laughs> I have I was in Virginia at the Jamestown just last year and I, I don't even I wish I had the source to approach you. But apparently it was stopped because they were afraid the Indians would capture some and figure out. <laughs> what archery really was about. I think the Indian world works fine. <laughs> Both is the same job, you know. I didn't say it was the reason was right was out. But we're so uh, the last incident uh, that I know of of the bow you being used in war was during I think it was the First World War. It was an officer of the Cheshire Regiment. His company had been pinned down by a machine gun fire, and he had taken, because he was an officer, you see, and had drinks tea like this, and awfully so, and uh, he was loud enough to take his longbow to war, because he was a bit of a chappy. And he took his bow to war, and he shot this machine gun nest up. He did it by means of what was called a cloud shoot, which is shoot your arrow in the air, allow it to drop straight down and over. So, that was uh, a commander of church zone, who they named the tank after, not after wood. Yeah. I know Winston Churchill was a great favour of uh, the Black Prince, and he did actually quote the stress they wanted in Russia to English victory ever. So I think he used some of their tactics. Anything <laughs> else? Okay, good. I'd like to thank everybody for coming along. I would hope that you have been enlightened somewhat to the 14th century medieval archer. Despicable gift as you could have been. Um, I'd like to thank once again, everybody for coming here tonight. I hope that you've enjoyed it. If you haven't, then don't tell everybody else. If you have, tell everybody else. And um, I hope to see all of these faces at the demo tomorrow at Trowbridge. Well, that would be really nice. What time? 2 p.m. And then you might be able to see a working display of the longbow in action by the Archers of the Latrins. Is, which is the name of our company. The other thing I would like to say is that we are not adverse to accepting anything that people would like to pass our way in the basis that to make this trip we have been funded in a small way by the University of Missouri. It would be very kind and second time they've asked it back. Unfortunately the funding has come nowhere near what it's cost us all to get here. And we have all funded our own airfares to come out here. That is not the problem, however. Um, I mentioned before a certain airline, which I won't mention again. And because they packed our 
specialist bows into the wrong hole, they all broke. They all broke before being drawn completely. You might see the damage that's been done here. So these are almost irreplaceable. They cost in the region of a thousand dollars each. We didn't lose one, we lost three. We also lost two other bows. And we also have another two bows which are probably going to break. And we have to go back to performance season. And we have to try and find a bow that we can make them because we're going to have a page for them. So if you've enjoyed it, <laughs> I would ask that if anybody has any loose change in their pocket, we will be more than grateful for that. Many thanks indeed.